Carlos Viglione here from Hong Kong, University of Hong Kong, That's right. who you don't need me to read All for right. you. We'll talk about Chinese universities and the Belt and Road Initiative. <coughs> Excuse me. You have his bio, so I will not read it to you. We will just get started. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank very you, Margot, and thank you very much for organizing this uh, event today. Uh, I am very happy to say that I travel with a cloud over me because I was uh, in Hong Kong and it was raining like crazy over there. We had a typhoon and then I had to go to Newport for my sister's daughter's wedding and it was pouring over there and then I came here and again the cloud is still over my head. So. If you like rain, just follow me. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I'll be back on a plane to Hong Kong, and I'm sure when I get there, there will be another typhoon. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about China's universities and the Belt and Road. A very general talk. Um, talk for about 20 minutes and, and uh, leave a lot of time for Q&A. It's a broad subject. Uh, what you're going to get is a uh, bit of my thinking uh, on this from recent uh, study and experience uh, in, uh, in the mainland and in Hong Kong. So uh, here we go. Uh, okay, I just turned it off, right? Okay. Uh, as you know, uh, China has uh, become a key player in the global economy. And I thought it'd be interesting since we're here in New York uh, and you probably had enough of this, but uh, that's Vincent Lowe on the right and Walter Chang on the left. There's a two Hong Kong, two Hong Kong uh, uh, tycoons who in 1991, when the Daily News had this as its headline, Trump in the slump, worried banks are pressing him for two billion debt, uh, they bailed him out. So if you want to know, um, why Fareed Zakaria published his book around that time, The Post-American World and the Rise of the Rest, the rest being China and, of course, India. Uh, this is part of it. I, I, I like to think that that photo is of Donald Trump is from the Peninsula Hotel uh, in Hong Kong, but I haven't been able to check it out. And, of course, you see books like this being published, China, Wealth and Power, the, the great book by Orville Wal Shell and, Del and John Delory. Uh, Mark, Martin Jock's book visited our university in Hong Kong recently, uh, When China Rule, Rules the World. And of course, uh, Huan Gang's book, uh, the, A New Type of Superpower, China in 2020. The China Dream, of course, the posters around the country are, um, are very visible. And this is the theme that's often heard about China's rejuvenation. Now, there was an article in the New York Times recently about a debate regarding, you know, this notion that China's GDP led the world for 17 centuries until the 18th century. China had uh, the, the greatest amount of global GDP. But uh, there, is, uh, there are some variations on that. There was a study at Princeton recently and uh, some discussion. Of course, China joined uh, the BRICS, uh, Russia, South Africa, and, and uh, Brazil, and India. And this is interesting because this was, of course, from February of this year, uh, Xi Jinping's two guidances. Uh, this was, I think, a, a significant talk. This was an internal uh, talk uh, to guide the international community to jointly build a more just and reasonably new world order and to guide the international community to jointly maintain international security. This is quite a change from Deng Xiaoping's notion of keeping, uh, uh, keeping uh, China's, China's um, development under the basket. Now, this is uh, s very significant when one considers, in historical perspectives, the cover of Time magazine. I don't know if you remember this. Um, I liked the subtitle, China, A Whole New Game. Uh, based on Xi Jinping's two guidances, Liang Zhidao, this is, in fact, a new game that China is playing. But the, the cover of the Time magazine at this time was meant for the, for the U.S., China 
it's a new game for the U.S., China. And I don't know if you recognize some of these people. There are, there's at least one person in this room who recognizes the ping pong team. Um, so we get back to the theme of the talk. This, of course, is uh, the, uh, the new initiative, the One Belt and One Road initiative. Uh, this gives you an idea of uh, the number of cities that the Belt and Road uh, takes up. Now, the Belt and Road concept, really the, the road is the, is the sea road. That's the southern uh, route. Uh, the southern, uh, yes, the southern route is the road. The belt is the, what we think of as the Silk Road, okay? Uh, sorry to slip th through these slides, slide through these slides quite quickly. Um, I want to I try to finish on 20 minutes. Uh, this uh, is very much of an infrastructural, em has an infrastructural emphasis, uh, China's Belt and Road uh, Initiative. This is a very personal uh, initiative for Xi Jinping. It was first proposed about 2013. Um, and it's, very m it's more about the domestic economy than the geopolitical side. It's, uh, and and it's, it's also very much about uh, domestic politics as well. It, it, some view it as a solution to the Western development strategy, which began around the turn of the century, the Go West policy. Um, which uh, has not turned out, I think, as well as it was expected to. Uh, the risk. Uh, now, the Belt and Road is viewed as a way to absorb a lot of the excess industrial mm -hmm. capacity. Uh, and part of the problem is many projects in China now, many of the officials who are from different provinces who, who are proposing new projects will put it in the context of Belt and Road. Everything is Belt and Road. In fact, even in Hong Kong, which is a different system, we hear Belt and Road every day. Um, and we're already having meetings at our university about Belt and Road. And should we hire an academic staff, a Belt and Road professor, and so on and so forth. Uh, this could be a lifeline for many of the state firms. As you know, there's a, many non-performing NP, non-performing loans. Are there too many eggs in one basket um, for the Belt and Road? Uh, now. If it works, it would certainly, uh, I use the word Trump, uh, the post-World War II Marshall Plan, if it works. And it will certainly rival, I think, the 1979 uh, opening and reform uh, of China. Is it, in, and uh, I also think it's too big to fail uh, at this point. It's too tied up with uh, the leader, uh, leadership in China to fail. So that's, that's part of the reason. It is massive. Already China has three trillion U.S. dollars worth of trade in 2014 to 16 with the uh, 68 uh, Belt and Road countries. Investment is over 50 billion. Uh, and on May 15th, uh, the uh, summit in Beijing for Belt and Road, uh, a few promises were made by Xi Jinping. Uh, 14 billion U.S. for Silk Road Fund, 36 billion for the China Development Bank loans, loans from the Export Import Bank of 18 billion, and humanitarian aid of 60 billion. So it's a massive project. And if it all works out well, there'll be lots of infrastructural projects developed in the Belt and Road countries in cooperation with China. So, what does this mean for China's universities? Will China's universities take a major role? Do they have the know-how? Do they have the capacity? Does China have the experience to make the Belt and Road work? Part of the um, responsibility will certainly fall on its university system. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, now, um, you might know that China has uh, several excellence initiatives, the 985. In fact, I was at the Great Hall of the People when Jiang Zemin gave his talk uh, at Beijing, uh, May 4th, 1980, 1998, at the 100th anniversary of Peking University, and announced that China would build world-class universities. And there's in, been a new, what we call 2.0, or Shuang uh, initiative to continue to strengthen its universities. So on the one side, you have a, an increase uh, in the number of Chinese universities that are in the world ranking, and on the other side, 
the uh, movement from elite to mass higher education. Uh, in 1990, about 4% of the age group was in higher education, and by 2020, it'll have about 40%. Uh, so that's a massive change. Here's what China's confronting, uh, and it's going to be very difficult to, to handle this, the middle income trap. A lot of uh, concern about China's development stalling, uh, as some of the Latin American countries uh, experienced in their rise. So we see that China's GDP is still low relative to other countries. Uh, it looks to South Korea, for example, as, as part of a, a model. Uh, is the economy slowing? You get different viewpoints uh, of, about, about this, but there's certainly been a decline in the number of Chinese workers. That won't pick up again till after 2020, and it'll pick up very slowly. Uh, urbanization, look at the, uh, the, the, the U.S. and China move. The U.S. Uh, took 50 years to move from 51% urbanization to 70. China, it will take 19 years to move to that uh, speed of urbanization. Uh, of course, China's uh, universities uh, are powered by the, uh, still powered by the planning system. And there are three key plans. There's the education plan, 2011 to 2020, which uh, is uh, what's called the medium to long-term education reform. You have the science uh, and technology plan, 2006 to 2020, and the medium to long-term talent development plan, 2010 to 2020. Still a very much of a top-down uh, system regarding the universities. So what do China's universities really look like? Largest number of students in the world right now, 36 million. Third in foreign students, and I know this is a question, how are they third in the number of international students? Uh, we'll talk about that later. Peking University's rank on the British Times Higher Education ranking of world-class universities. Peking University is now number 14th, and Tsinghua University is 17 in the world. Amazing rise in the last few years. China is second in the, G number, the amount of gross domestic product for research and development, second in the number of scientific publications, 3,000 institutions, 1.57 million academic staff, and of course, the PISA, those of you familiar with the school, uh, PISA International Ranking 60 Country, Shanghai came out number one uh, a year ago, a couple of years ago, last time. So GDP rise, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, from 0.6% of GDP for R&D in 1995. It will be 2.5% in 2020. Now look at Hong Kong, 0.7%. If Hong Kong was a country, that would be ranked about 50th in the world. And, um, and uh, it still manages to do fairly well in, in terms of its universities. Uh, research and development forecast uh, to 2024, China it will, uh, will uh, uh, exceed the United States and the EU in, in that extent. Now, when you look at the university ranking, in the left column were the 2016 rankings. In the second column, uh, Harvard hasn't moved. Uh, now, this is the uh, Times Higher Ed ranking. But notice Peking University and Tsinghua University, in comparison to the University of Hong Kong, um, I don't know if there's a pointer on here, but one of the interesting things is, look at, look at the University of Hong Kong, internationalization, 99% in terms of the way the Times Higher Ed uh, calculates the ranking. And uh, the, uh, Peking University is about half that much, and Tsinghua less. But look where they excel. They excel in industry income, the amount of income that the universities get from industries. Th that, I think, explains a lot of their rise. What, how can it be 100? 100 percent? The 100 is the, the maximum uh, amount in their, uh, that I mean, you could, the way it's calculated, it's calculated in the proportion of rank, proportion of income that the universities 
will get from industry on the times higher ed scale. The times higher ed scale has 100%. They usually calculate the, the top, would, they would look at the proportion that the number one university in the ranking gets. Uh, and so you would say whatever university is ranked at the top, it's probably Caltech that year. I'm sorry if I don't, don't remember. Or probably MIT, I'm sorry. Um, so MIT would, would be one. And everybody else is, you know, below that. Um, sorry, I can't give you a better answer to that, but clearly this is something they, they do very well at. Now, the reforms, the, um, these are just three selected reforms. They're recalibrating to more skill-based education because of the economic restructuring, but there are quite a few experiments in liberal arts or what they often call general education, and Sino-foreign programs and campuses have expanded. Um, here are some of the Sino-foreign campuses. You're probably familiar with these. At the top, Duke University of Quinshan, the University of Nottingham has been there before the others. NYU Shanghai, of course. UIC is the Hong Kong Baptist University in Zhuhai. Um, Xi'an Jiao Tong University in Liverpool, University from the UK and the Chinese University of Hong Kong has just established a campus in Shenzhen. Now, if you look at the campuses themselves, these are quite something, uh, very impressive. I was particularly impressed. I was at Duke Kunshan a few days ago uh, before Boston. I went direct from, from Shanghai to Boston. And they are actually even doubling the size of that campus. Amazing place. NYU only has one building, but it's right in the center of, of downtown, and uh, they're also running a liberal arts program. That On the bottom right, that's, that's Nottingham University in Ningbo, which is the replica of the one in, in uh, Nottingham. I'm sorry I have to go through these quickly. These are the Hong Kong campuses. Uh, I, I always have to put this, quest, this quotation by, by Ezra Vogel. It's, it's a bit dated, but uh, it, if I may read it. The result of China's opening and reform for higher education has been an intellectual vitality that may be as broad and deep as the Western Renaissance. Okay. So when China looks at its universities today, it, it looks at itself and sees <laughs> quite an amazing transformation. Not surprising. And not surprising that its universities will probably have, not only through its international students which are studying, its students which come to the US and UK, Western Europe, Canada, Australia, but also uh, I think through, uh, its, its, uh, through other means, will begin to influence the system. Now the other side of it is my old friend Philip Altbach from Boston College, who spends uh, quite a bit of time in China and around the world, they, he has the higher International Higher Education Center there. He has two, he has, uh, he has a recent article that talks about the glass ceiling. And by the glass ceiling, he means the limitations on autonomy. And clay feet, by which he means that the bottom of the system, second and third tier universities, are still quite weak. Uh, autonomy is an issue. Uh, uh, we did a study comparing Hong Kong and the mainland. We asked academics in both places, and I, I won't get into the details of the study. At your institution, which has the primary influence? Faculty committees. And the red line, Hong Kong, and the blue lines, the mainland China. As far as you know, the bottom, let me read the bottom part. Approving new programs, evaluating teaching, setting internal research priorities, evaluating research, enabling international, part, uh, national, international linkages. Clearly, academics in Hong Kong feel much more empowered uh, and, and academics in the mainland much less. Uh, there are many of these tables, and we ask about the, the state, the government, uh, the university leaders, uh, the, 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 the deans, and, and then we get to faculty committees. This is the other issue, Jiao Yu Gongping, equity and fairness has become quite an issue. It's also an issue here, if you look at the cost of higher education, particularly for the top tier universities. Well, it's a global issue, if, if, from, if you read Piketty's book about capital, 
Uh, and in China, this is, this is becoming an issue. And of course, parents take to the streets when things don't seem like uh, they're, they're fair, when, when they change the system uh, of allocation uh, of provinces, quotas from different provinces to universities. Parents were on the streets. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, low quality colleges are an issue. Um, okay. This is where the rubber meets the road and the major concern, and I, I recently worked with the Ministry of Education, the Asian Development Bank, on, on the graduation problem of getting jobs. Uh, eight million graduates, eight million graduates this, this, uh, this June. Uh, how many of them will have jobs? Now the media, not only the foreign media, but even the Chinese media has played this up. 30% uh, to 40% of the students are not don't have jobs by graduation and so on. Now, from a closer look at this, in MyCoS, the, there's, a, there's a, a sort of a, a company that also gathers data on this. The problem really decreases after about six months. Many of the students hold off in taking jobs. They'll, they'll stay with their parents or they'll, they'll, they'll wait. But about 90% of them, six months to, to a year later, uh, it, it's not as much of a serious problem. But the, the, the kind of education they're getting, now here's a familiar face, no? Jack Ma, Jack Ma Mr. Alibaba. I had the pleasure of chairing a, a talk when he was in Hong Kong, he and, and a number of, uh, of other uh, people about, uh, about higher education. And he was very, very dissatisfied. He basically said, I can't use any of the graduates. Uh, they, they're not able to, to do the kinds of things I, I'd like them to do. Uh, we need more uh, entrepreneurialism, innovation, and so on. Uh, so th this is uh, another of the, the challenges. Lots of difficult balances for the universities. I like this picture because, as you know, this was the, uh, the, 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 the walk between the two twin towers. No time to talk about that. We're probably running out of time. Uh, domestically, the universities have to balance the demands of people like Jack Ma and an in industry for skills, but also the urban middle class for status culture. They want to differentiate their children uh, from, uh, from the rest by having a high status uh, trademark, a branded higher education. And the state, major concern, stability, and of course prosperity. Globally, the universities have to figure out a way to balance not only the deepening internationalization, but also this protection of education sovereignty, which the state demands. And at the same time, to get more autonomy. Now, the universities have been given some more autonomy. The degrees at universities were issued by the state, by the government, until recently. Now, the government's beginning to say to the universities, you can offer the degrees which means you have more autonomy to shuffle around your curriculum. To, because the responsibility for getting jobs clearly is going to move to students. It's now the responsibility, students graduate, can't find a job, their parents look at the universities, the government, and say, why aren't my children finding a job? But they're going to be having more autonomy to select electives, to not commit their majors in the first year, and then if they don't find a job later on, some of the responsibility is, is on, is on uh, their own shoulders. So, um, okay, I've got about five minutes. Lots of things happening. There's a, a new university, Asian, well, let, let, me, let me just skip ahead and just mention that. On the Belt and Road, there are a number of universities in different countries which are in the top 500 according to the AWRU. That's the Shanghai Jiao Tong ranking, a very object, the most objective ranking of universities. 13 in Russia, 14 in Southeast Asia, 9 in India, 34 in the Middle East, 16 in the East, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And the excellence initiatives have increased in these countries. So the Belt and Road country universities which have exchanges with China will, will play a role. This is China's first Belt and Road University, I think. This is Xiamen University. It's ranked in the top 10 in China. They have a big campus now in Malaysia. By the way, Beijing University was also invited to Malaysia, but they held back. 
uh, the China ASEAN College of Marine Science in, in Malaysia. Suzhou University is in Laos. Uh, there are others. This is a forum of Belt and Road, a nurturing talent for Belt and Road uh, development. Tsinghua University, now this isn't the Belt and Road, but I just have to mention this one. Tsinghua is set up in Seattle, amazing. Of course they get $40 million from, from Microsoft. So how is this going to happen? How do, you, how do you put together two very different intellectual traditions? The, the Western Academy and the Chinese Academy, which has its roots back even before, uh, before uh, the establishment of Oxford and, and Cambridge. And I think right now it's sort of like this. Uh, they don't really line up very well. And I don't know how this is going to happen. Of course, you talk to Philip Alpach in Boston. He says, there's only one model in the world for a university. But there are others like Simon the Marginson in, in the UK saying that there's a Chinese model. This is a, a, the kind of uh, what you often hear now. Will Asia just be producing more of the same Western-originated contemporary higher education? Or will it be able to unleash a more critical understanding and practice of higher education? Um, this is a Hong Kong president of a university. Now, I didn't translate these, just want to give you an idea of some of the, the people who are writing about the Chinese intellectual model. Now, the reason it's not translated, of course the classics have been translated, but the modern contemporary theorists, we're translating them now into English uh, to, to, get them, uh, to get them out. But look at the books being published recently, Liberal Arts, Education and Colleges in East Asia. The largest expansion of liberal arts is not in South America, not in Europe, not in uh, other parts of the world. It's in Asia. And um, books like this, General Education and the Development of Global Citizenship, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the Mainland. These two books, uh, the one on the left, Bill Kirby, uh, former dean at Harvard, and uh, Marek van de Vende from, from Amsterdam, Experiences in Liberal Arts, in, in, uh, this includes the US, Europe, and Asia. This book was produced in China. Uh, and this special issue of a journal, uh, this is the Tsinghua University English Language Journal of Education, New Directions in Liberal Arts and Sciences. This is also uh, edited by Bill Kirby and Marek van de Vende. So, university students in China, are you ready for startups? Uh, lots of, uh, you know, uh, China's moving into the robotic areas. Of course, the, the, the robots can now uh, beat on the Chinese game Go. That apparently, computers and robots can now beat human beings. But the question for liberal arts is the emphasis is really for Chinese students now on their CVs. The question will be, is that, is that what liberal arts is for, for getting a job? Is, is there anything more to it? I looked at the Chinese journals. I did a, uh, a search. There's a way to do a web search. This is the number of articles in China that use the Chinese word for liberal arts education, boya jiao yu. It's increasing year by year. There's a little dip this year, and I don't know why there's been a dip, but the number has increased, uh, and so you're up around. 75 to 80 articles per year. Using the term general education, it's up to about 750 articles per year. <clears throat> uh, now, I'll skip through this. The point, the point is uh, this is becoming uh, of, of, of interest. So there's a new vector in Chinese higher education. It's called liberal arts higher education. And uh, <clears throat> the question is, uh, and, and, and it's clear why. And a lot of it has to do with economic restructuring. The, the previous uh, vice premiers, Zhu Rongji and, and, and uh, Wen Jiabao, we need to depend on creative, independent thinking. China's uh, space, uh, space uh, uh, astrophysicist Chen Shui Sung, none of our institutions of higher education is running in the right direction. None is cultivating ex excellent talent that is innovative enough. So this also drives uh, the, uh, the model. And I think there's an interesting question about liberal arts higher education for the Belt and Road countries.
What is it going to be like? Shaman University, for example, has a liberal arts general education curriculum in the mainland. Now it has a campus in Malaysia. What are they doing there? Obstacles and challenges. Okay. I think I've got one minute left. So I'm going to... Now, I went through the Chinese journals to look at what the Chinese academics say are the obstacles to liberal arts and general education, and I found 12 of them. May I run through these quickly? Most of them are going to seem very familiar to liberal arts higher education in the U.S., okay? Confusion over the idea of it and the aims of it. Significant in theory, but insignificant in practice. General education is mistaken as merely extra knowledge learning or intro courses in different fields. Students are overburdened with the curriculum. Um, there's low motivation among some professors and students. I like the picture of the professor on the right. Uh, wonderful picture. Uh, conflict between what's general education and professional education. Bureaucratic, ma now this is, this is China. Bureaucratic management is onerous. Low level of institutionalization. The key leaders, some of them support, some don't support. That's a problem. Designing, systematic design. Now you don't have to, I'm just, that uh, is just to give you an idea of, of some of the details which are necessary to have a good liberal arts curriculum. Liberal arts general education could to insufficient resources in the Chinese literature, lack of qualified teachers, lack of graduate students to serve as assistants, large-scale classes, and low quality is a concern, assessment, how to assess uh, liberal arts education is a concern, it's not just quantitative, it should be qualitative, and of course, not surprisingly, the conflict between general education and political education. Here's my take and I'll try to wrap this up. <coughs> My take is that on the Belt and Road, China's universities will rebalance the hard and soft aspects of its power, meaning the hard aspects, engineering for infrastructure, but it will use the opportunity, the soft power initiative. Its liberal arts or its general education courses will become part of Chinese universities on the Belt and Road. And the question is, is the world ready for that kind of model? It depends on what country. If you put it in Kazakhstan or if you put it in Hungary, it may be different. Although Hungary is now pushing out George Soros's university because they feel it's too much tied to the U.S. university. That's, that's a whole other issue. Uh, this is, these are some of the quotations I get from the Chinese literature about the Belt and Road. Education journals now. We must avoid the clash of civilizations. National unity is the core. By the way, not global citizenship, but how to relate to others. The One Belt and Road will be a new challenge and a new opportunity for China's education reform, opening to the outside world. Two scholars at Zhejiang University, soft power is more important than hard power. This is an article about the Belt and Road. And finally, uh, from Beijing Normal University, Liu Fuxing, how we have to figure out how to win support of the masses on the Belt and Road countries. Here's what I think the probable outcomes will be. More joint degrees, more Chinese campuses, more student academic and labor mobility between China and the Belt and Road countries, and more complicated language issues at the universities. Will there be more dual passports? I, there are none now. That's a question. And finally, I think the Belt and Road Universities, China's Belt and Road Universities, will of course bring a deepening of uh, trade and ideas, uh, but I think they will be English medium universities. Only English medium universities, China's universities on the Belt and Road. However, Chinese proficiency will be taught, will be required upon graduation. And uh, I think we can already see signs of that. 
I think China will have its own model of liberal studies, and it won't look like the model that we have here in the United States. And I think the Belt and Road countries themselves will determine the limits of academic freedom in those countries. And I don't think that'll be an issue for China's universities on the Belt and Road because they're external. Thank you very much for your attention. A new book just out, a collection of readings. And if I may end the talk um, with, to remind us of sustainability for our <laughs> poor friends up in the Arctic. Uh, I flew over, of course, when you come from Shanghai, you fly over the Arctic. And I looked down, and I, I didn't exactly see the situation, but I thought about uh, some of the problems up there. I think I went over for a few minutes. Sorry I raced through that. Uh, I, uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Marty. Uh, there are experts on student, uh, uh, international students here in this room, but uh, uh, there seem to be, there seems to be, there seem to be some effect of the Trump administration uh, or the Trumpism on uh, the number of Chinese students coming to the U.S., but we can't, can't know for sure. You have to actually ask. Uh, we in Hong Kong have benefited a little bit uh, from this, and I think uh, uh, it's very possible that um, Chinese, well, you're talking about Chinese students coming this way, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually very concerned about uh, the other direction, uh, being in Hong Kong and, ha and how we can take <coughs> advantage of that. But uh, uh, I think um, the, uh, um, for Chinese students coming, um, will they go to Belt and Road countries, for example? I think after they come back from overseas study, and uh, they, they may, if they become academics, if they do graduate work and get doctorates, they may very well take up posts in Belt and Road countries, or they may do a few years there, just as some of the Chinese professors are sent to, to the western parts of China for a few years, and then they, they come back, and sometimes there's a bit of a a bit of a promotion uh, in it for them. Uh, but uh, certainly this has to be a way uh, for that talent uh, to become much more mobile and take advantage. What's the incentive to go and work in Kazakhstan? Um, and obviously if there's a financial incentive that, that will help or a promotion uh, if one goes that way. So uh, I think Will it affect, how will it affect, uh, do you need in the curriculum here, if Chinese students come here, do you need to talk more about Belt and Road? Do you need to talk more about uh, um, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Sri Lanka, and uh, uh, Malaysia, and Thailand, for example? Uh, uh, this this is, is cl it's not clear now, but the initiative is uh, very detailed and very comprehensive. So uh, this is going to have some implications for, for students. Uh, close. Uh, Bob Peters, I said Hi, Bob. Also, I think it's very important. Okay. Yeah. Follow up on that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Will more American students be attracted to Belt and Road countries to study? Certainly short term. Uh, we already see st American students going to, well, to my university, which is part of the 
are we Belt and Road? We're, we're, we're really considered far, when you go to the airport, there's Hong Kong and international, it's together. Uh, but um, I think uh, uh, you see American students doing a semester in, uh, in Thailand, in, 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 in India, um, in uh, certainly you know, South Korea and uh, Kazakhstan, those places, how many would go and spend time. Uh, I, I'm not sure, certainly in Eastern Europe, in Hungary, I know of several American students that, that spent a year there. Um, so, uh, it, you know, the U.S. system has already reached a level of mass, a certain level of massification, whereas China hasn't. So there will be more and more students, and, and that means they'll go to more and more places. But uh, I, I, uh, I, when I, when I talk to American students, they still seem to be very much focused on, uh, you know, Paris, Rome, and uh, maybe Tokyo. Uh, and uh, to attract them to other places might take some time. And of course the Belt and Road countries will develop uh, and that may, and things may change, it may become more adventuresome. That's an interesting question. Uh, on the Gaokao, it has continually reformed itself. And uh, the, the one thing about the Gaokao which I is interesting, uh, I have a, one of my doctoral students studying the Gaokao, is the, the amount of uh, analytical and critical thinking ability that it takes to get a good score on the Gaokao. You know, we have this association of the Gaokao with the Koju, you know, being a very memorization-oriented kind of exam, which it isn't anymore. And uh, Scott Roselle at Stanford University and his team uh, came out and said that uh, students who take, senior secondary students taking the Gaokao in mainland China uh, display a higher level of critical thinking than students in the United States. I mean, that's how far they're going. To, to talk about the reform of, of the Gaokao. Nevertheless, it's a very stressful examination and it puts a lot of uh, stress on students in China through their school careers and parents, some of them, uh, and, and it's very reasonable for them to think this way, why not uh, send my son or daughter to a secondary school overseas and take the G take the, not the GREs, the uh, yes. SATs uh, in the United States and uh, go to university in the U.S. Or else, uh, if they don't do very well in the Gaokao to spend the, the amount of money it costs to go to a good U.S. university. Uh, I think that uh, those considerations are reasonable. However, some parents are beginning to realize that with China's uh, development now, when you, when you go overseas to, uh, even for just your university degree or even more, uh, you lose all that social capital when you get back. And to get a good job in China, 
you must of course understand what's going on even at, even at a young age, you have a general sense of how to operate within the Chinese context. Uh, you can learn a lot in the U.S. context, but to, 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 uh, to keep your, uh, your networks for getting jobs. This seems to be one of the areas. So, the, so what does that mean? Uh, about, will that cut down on the number of people who will leave? Uh, will they say, well, it's better to stay? As the quality and the number of universities of high quality. So you might not get into Tsinghua, Fudan, Shanghai Jiao Tong, Zhongshan University, but, but the others you can graduate and still get a good job and have a good middle class urban lifestyle. Would they go to Belt and Road countries? I don't think so. Now again, I'm looking at Belt and Road countries in terms of low level of development. Now you could consider uh, you can consider uh, Singapore is a Belt and Road country, uh, and Malaysia, and, and, and there are lots of, you know, you can do very well in those countries. That's not looking at a, a, a Laos, for example, or, or, or Tajikistan. S but what about the, um, the 100 million popula 120 million population of ethnic minorities, many of them in the West, and they're on the borders, for example, in Myanmar and Burma, uh, the, the groups that straddle the border. They may very well, and in fact, they already do go over the border for schools sometimes. Uh, the borders are very porous in certain areas. And what about uh, the Tajik people in Xinjiang? Would they go to university in Tajikistan if they have a good university? Uh, Kazakhstan, there's been a lot of interest. Kazakhstan is doing well economically. Uh, as is the Republic of Mongolia. Uh, the World Bank sees them as uh, they're, they're going to take off uh, in terms of all the mineral wealth that they have. Would, would someone want to go there uh, for university from Inner Mongolia? Yeah, it's very possible that, uh, that they would uh, move in that direction. Again, it's, it's, it's incentives and, and some sort of ethnic affinity. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that they're going to be separatists in China, but there could be an, an affinity for that country. So that's a great question. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if I answered it completely, but. Yeah, let me clarify. I'm sorry. We're talking about the, the universities in the Belt and Road countries, and then we're talking about Chinese universities setting up in the Belt and Road countries. Now, there will be campuses, but there will also be joint degree programs in the national university. China's cooperation with, say, Mongolia, uh, the University of Mongolia, or the Medical University of Mongolia, or the University of Science and Technology in Ulaanbaatar, for example. There could be a joint degree program with uh, uh, Huhahata University. Uh, uh, now, that's, that's a little bit different. What about the student populations? Will there be Chinese students there? They may be there for short term. Uh, they, they may be there for a short time. Most of them would probably stay, of course, in China. But the option's open. Uh, just as the U.S. universities, like NYU, want half of their students to come from the U.S. and other countries to bring them into China, Chinese universities on the Belt and Road may very well want some of the students to be uh, you know, from the mainland. It's a great question, but it's still in the early stages. Thank you. Chris, and then Peggy. Uh, Chris Merck at Afro Worldwide. <coughs> I wonder if you would give a, a little more uh, detail on the response of uh, 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 Hong Kong to uh, this new opportunity at uh, an institutional level. You mentioned a couple of campuses being established in Shenzhen and Zhuhai, which is not particularly imaginative. But nevertheless, it's an institutional response, and you could call it, oh, or 
I'm not sure you need to call it home or you could also call it Pearl River integration, mm -hmm. Delta integration, which has been a long subject. But anyway, you could call it home board. Uh, are there other things that are happening at an institutional level? And then if you look at the academic and intellectual life of the university, are other faculty members than yourself in seriously engaged in research around this general theme? And then what about your students? Do you have Hong Kong students who say, you know, I'd like to spend a semester in Kazakhstan or Malaysia or wherever, and I'd be interested in doing it in a campus established by a mainland Chinese university? And would HKU give them credit for doing that? Those, I mean, a little more. Yeah, Chris, uh, these are. Uh, number of ways it'd be interesting to know what's going on. Great questions. Hong Kong. Great questions. Thanks, Chris and talk about uh, the home base. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention Africa. I mean, more and more Hong of our students are spending semesters in Africa and very excited when they come back. One of my students is, uh, has spent time there. But our university, for example, has been trying to, well, we have a student from Ethiopia, and we had, I'm sorry, a professor from Ethiopia, and we had a professor from Ghana who left trying to establish a Center for African Studies, and we haven't been able to do it, whereas the mainland is way ahead of us with Africa. We, we probably have maybe two, in our university, maybe two professors from Africa, but our vice president, um, who uh, was at the University of uh, uh, Minnesota for most of his career, uh, originally from Taiwan, is now in. Uh, Africa, South Africa, and Ethiopia touring to build build some kinds of uh, connections. Um, so uh, what I would say is, uh, first of all, we hear about the Belt and Road every day now. Um, the chief executive, Learn Chun Ying, uh, proposed a billion Hong Kong dollars to kick off an initiative with Belt and Road countries to get student exchanges going on. That would, because these people will be the leaders in their countries in the future. And, uh, but we already have students from, and academic staff. I have in my own, uh, in my hallway, uh, South Korea, Kazakhstan, Russia, uh, UK, England, you know, uh, Serbia. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we have a very international staff. In our university, more than half of the staff have are non-locals, uh, not from Hong Kong. So uh, we're very international in that respect. Student population is less international. It's we have 80 percent students from the city of Hong Kong, and that's because the money comes from the taxpayers of Hong Kong. They don't want to to open it. Further. So we've got 20% of our students are not from Hong Kong. That means 10% from the mainland of China and 10% from international uh, other countries. And uh, that is the case for bachelor degree students. When you get to doctoral students, most of the students are not from Hong Kong. They are from the mainland and other countries. Um, we uh, uh, are uh, talking about the Belt and Road in terms of logistics. Hong Kong is very good at logistics, banking, putting together business deals, uh, putting together um, the legal provisions for um, those kinds of uh, uh, you know, helping China, for example, in its in its Belt and Road initiatives, particularly in on the on the road part, the southern part. Uh, our university changes. Uh, we you know we've introduced we've gone from a three-year specialized British system to a four-year uh, very American-style liberal arts kind of situation. Uh, all the universities in Hong Kong have done that. Uh, we, um, so we're, we're very much, um, and clearly need to, I think, think Belt and Road. Hong Kong is concerned about its competitive edge. As I say, it doesn't get much funding for research and development, 
and if you look at Shanghai, it can't compete with the, it can compete, but not as well as in the past with the five or six S's. That's Shenzhen, Shanghai, Seoul, Singapore, Sydney in Australia, San Francisco. Uh, it has to compete with these places. And it has to become much more entrepreneurial. And it missed the high-tech opportunity when Hong Kong was one of the four dragons back in the, the late 80s. And Taiwan and, 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 and South Korea and Singapore, the governments said we're investing in high-tech. Hong Kong dropped out. It's trying to catch up now. Just established a government bureau for technology and innovation. We have Mr. Jack Ma now living in Hong Kong. Well, he has property in Hong Kong as he lived there. But Ten Tangent Company in China, you know, these people, we, we invite them to talk to our students out there from Huawei. Our students all use WeChat. They don't use WhatsApp. And we're, you know, we're, we're trying to get our students to become more entrepreneurial. Now, the Bay Area plan is a is a, is a lifeline, I think, for Hong Kong. Uh, and the Guangdong uh, Education Bureau is trying to, they say, double the amount of investment in their universities. I mean, I'm, be, I'm being asked to, to, same salary, I'm being asked to go to universities in Guangdong. For the, you know, Hong Kong can compete, I mean, they can compete with the Hong Kong salaries. Um, so they're looking at uh, this Belt and Road area to really take off. I, Hong Kong has just Hong Kong has a science park, which which is doing okay. But it, it's just building another science park on the border with Shenzhen because Shenzhen is really far more innovative than, than Hong Kong is in technology. So uh, that science park will straddle the border with Shenzhen to take advantage of that. Uh, so that's what we we're dealing with, and of course our university. Um, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in the ranking, I, I forget, you know, where we are. We were way ahead of all the Chinese universities in the mainland. But now we're below Beijing University and, and Tsinghua University. So, are we, well, it depends, you know, how you look at it. Really? Well, the quality of education to the students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just not the case. Peggy? Yes, so who are you? Well, if China establishes, well, for example, the campus in Xiamen, uh, why, if it used Chinese, I mean, there, would, there are Chinese, uh, there's a 30% maybe Chinese population, uh, but they're in the north, and uh, that, that's not where the university is. Uh, it, it would make much more sense, I think, to have. But I'm asking, is it actually an official position, or is this your speculation? I wasn't sure. Oh, it, it's. It's English medium now. It, it is the Shaman University is English medium. Is there an official? Uh, there is no official policy on on Chinese universities over now. All of these countries have Confucian institutes. Right. Okay. Right. So, but what's the connection? Right. But I guess my question is, if they're going to go for English language, which makes a lot of sense in terms of you know, all these different countries speak all these different languages, and you're forced to speak Chinese, or you're going to pick an international language. But if that's the case. Right, right. Amazing. They teach um, engineering but, English. But what's, if, at what point will they commit to what the language instruction is going to be? Because it makes a huge difference yeah. to how it's affordable for other people. <laughs> yeah. Do they sell their English language tests all across the world? Well, I think the amount of human resources will determine how many campuses yeah. and so on, and the scale of the campuses and the programs. I mean, look at Tsinghua University in, in Seattle is, is going to basically be computer science. The question is, will they 
do what Duke has done. Duke started with three master degree programs. Now they're going into you know, rapid expansion. I, I think it's uh, going to take quite a while. F uh, you know, I'm, you know, I love talking about this, but it's going to take quite a while for there to be campuses. Programs, Chinese uh, cooperation, uh, having uh, degree programs or training programs at universities in the Belt and Road, I can see that happening uh, very easily. Well, you know, for, well, here, here it goes, sort of goes like this. If you go to a Belt and Road country and you want to set up a program, of course they have their own language. The, the chances of the Chinese being able to communicate in that language <coughs> is less. English is still that, that international medium. I mean, I think that's recognized. It makes much more sense. And then, do, uh, is, there ac is there academic staff to do that? I don't see, m when I'm at university, camp particularly the top tier university campuses in China, um, I mean, the, the ability to communicate in English, uh, I mean, it, it's required. You know, graduate students have to take an exam in English. So he, I think that's not going to be as much of a, of a problem. Uh, again, it's great to, to speculate on this. There is a reality on the ground so far. And I'm sure that the campus in Seattle is going to be in the medium of English. Uh, but. Um, uh, but there's an interest in learning uh, uh, Chinese. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking of the visit by Xi Jinping to Mar-a-Lago, Mar is it called? Mar and uh, and uh, Premier, uh, President Xi Jinping was there with, uh, with, his, uh, with his wife uh, and Donald Trump's granddaughter stood in front of them reciting Chinese Tang Dynasty poetry and singing uh, Chinese songs and reciting the, the thousand character classic in front of them. Uh, the, the interest in uh, learning Chinese will remain um, very strong or will get stronger obviously as, as time goes on. But I just don't see it as uh, being the medium, particularly for engineering and science. So, uh, uh, yeah. Hey, Frank? Uh, a case study. Put aside Belt and Road, this, that, the other. If you're going to have a university to university collaboration, you have to have some kind of academic model and some kind of business model. Presumably also some demand, mm. um, some projection. Mm. Specifically with regard to. Suzhou University, you said, is working in Laos. Do you know what the answer to those questions are for Suzhou and whatever the Laotian counterpart is? Well, what I what I know uh, is is that uh, Laos within Southeast Asia is uh, one of the weaker economies, but has very good close relations with China and it was it was not very difficult um, for um, for Su Zhou to accept an invitation to do something there. Um, in terms of the demand, the was it the was access the that invited them? Well it, yeah, they from what I understand they, they talked about it. They had acad they had one of the departments at uh, Su Zhou University had uh, exchanges and uh, it evolved from there uh, who, uh, Laos of course has to formally invite, uh, but, but whether, you know, how it evolved, uh, I don't know. But uh, clearly um, there's a lot to gain f uh, for La Laos. The access rate in higher education is, is still, um, you know, 10% or less. And uh, there is a need to uh, to improve the quality, and Suzhou University is would I think help them in terms of uh, assessing the quality of education or providing a better managerial model um, for for Laos. In terms of demand, uh, eventually, the, I mean, the whole Southeast Asian area is going to be expanding higher ed. 
in terms of uh, they're going to need to do that move from elite to mass higher education. So the demand will be there. But I don't think Suzhou University is going to be picking up, you know, a gi giant segment of the of the Laos uh, relevant age group for higher ed. I mean, it's a small, very small operation, but uh, they do have, you know, they've decided to to work with them. It's a small operation. So, yeah. A big surprise to me back around 2000, I tried to work a project. the road from that literally. No sense of how you could turn that reality, major industrial park, into something that links to your university. Right. Mm -hmm. And all they could think of for American entities coming in is like, oh, we're very happy to let you name that building after your Thanks, uh, Frank. John Hartman, I'm going to the public. And I read an article in the New York Times in early May by Ai Weiwei, yeah. in, in which he was very highly critical of the government of China. Hmm. And his main point was that when you are not allowed to be aware of information, it hollows you out in your personhood that you can't grow, you can't explore. So I'd like to hear from yeah, you. Do you think yeah. if he's an outlier or there's a lot of people in China that feel that way? And if you think a major university can truly perform its function of allowing students to explore and grow into themselves yeah. in, in, yeah. the, in, those, in that environment? Yeah, this is a key question. I mean, we, we're talking about liberal arts in China. And from our perspective, there's a contradiction. How can you have liberal arts at the same time that clearly there's been a concern by government that they, they need to tighten up the control of the universities, need to control, tighten up on party leadership and so on. How do you put those two together? How do you produce, how do you restructure the economy? How do you, which, which needs to move toward innovation now, uh, how do you produce those kinds of people uh, when, at the same time, the media, I mean, that's, I always talking about information, and in the arts, I mean, you know, he has lots of difficulties. How do you do that? By the way, Ai Weiwei, it, there's one interesting thing about China. There are academics who are equivalent to Ai Weiwei in the sense of their ability to, to, to speak up because of their sort of their family or father. Ai Weiwei, of course, is the, is the son of uh, um, uh, Ai, Ching. Ai Ching. So, I mean, you know, there are certain academics, some academics can do that and others cannot. I mean, there's that aspect. So the, the reason I mention that is because there's, there's the question of, uh, is Ai Weiwei an outlier? Okay, how do you know who's an outlier if some people are in a more protective situation to speak to speak up? But uh, the way I uh, see this is that I, I, I do not think that liberal arts is going to change China to become, you know, like the U.S. liberal arts. It's going to China's going to do what it did in the special economic zones. It's going to experiment with Western management techniques, uh, Western uh, educational methods, uh, whether it's how you teach, whether it's, uh, you know, the kind of curriculum, a liberal arts curriculum which focuses on creativity. It's going to do that. But for China, the, the priority 
is stability and economic prosperity. That's it. That is it. it it's not like, okay, we're going to, hey, liberal arts, let's m just go liberal arts. It, it's not, it's, it's, it, it's a different dimension of, of thinking. So, but at the same time, uh, there's clearly a willingness uh, to, to really sit down and talk about this. I mean, I was at Duke Quinchen, uh, and we had a two-day workshop with people from, from the universities in China who know about liberal arts and are involved, with those from overseas who are in it. And there was a lot of very, very frank talk about, uh, you know, there's a willingness to talk about it. Um, but it clearly, um, it's not going to be like it is here. So, how do you produce creative people and innovative people? And my answer to that is China is so large that even if it takes, a, even if a small part of the country, like say one-sixth or one-quarter of the, of it, it gets very liberal artsy, creative, and innovative, that's still more than the entire country of the U.S. Uh, in terms of the scale. So China can do, I think, all these things. It can, have, it can maintain, at, at this point, in the current political, economic, and social situation, I see that it, it can maintain uh, social stability and focus on economic prosperity at the same time that it tries very hard in, in all different sorts of ways to produce the kind of talent. Why? So that it can compete with the other global, eco global economy players. And, uh, you know, you look at, look at what's happening in, in China. You look at uh, some of the innovative companies, um, you know, whether it's Tencent or Huawei or, or, or WeChat or whatever. Uh, and so I think that's the way it's going to happen, and it's going to be a slow evolution. Now, who knows what it's going to be like in 50 years, but that's it now. And people like, uh, uh, there are people like Ai Weiwei. There are lots of them in Hong Kong. Now, you come to Hong Kong, we are part of China. And no one, not one academic in Hong Kong has been fired for political views. They're criticized. There are local, the local media, the, you know, sort of more patriotic leaning media will criticize them and they don't like it. Uh, the academics uh, don't feel comfortable about that sort of criticism. But um, you can read anything you want. The internet is totally open and none of this has changed. Um, so uh, it, you know, it's been in China, it's 20 years in, in China. So it's, uh, it, you know, you, you have lots of dimensions. So the question that you're asking, I mean, this is the key question, I think, for many, many of us who have worked in U.S. universities. How can you juggle both? And I think uh, so far, because of the scale of the country, uh, China manages to, uh, to juggle some of these things, uh, even though they're outspoken uh, academics and intellectuals. Thank you. Well, maybe that's an uh, optimistic note <laughs> on which to end. It is 7 o'clock. Was that optimistic? Thank really? You. I thought that was... Well, okay. Thank, thank you. you.